Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, next up, we have Dan Forbes, our developer advocate from Parity, and he's going to be talking us through the anatomy of a substrate node. Uh, let you take it from here, Dan. All right. Thank you, CA. Yeah. Uh, appreciate the intro. And uh, ostensibly, I'm, I'm talking about this very kind of uh, scientific sounding topic, the anatomy of a substrate node. But as I was kind of thinking through this presentation and, you know, what it really is, uh, kind of one of the things that came to mind is like most good, what I hope is a good presentation, it's really just a story. And in fact, if you attended the last Sub-Zero, you may remember that my buddy uh, Joshi talked a little bit about shared storytelling and, and how blockchains sort of facilitate that. And so in some ways, I hope that maybe this kind of is part of, of that that story that Joshi started to share. And Joshi will be speaking later today. Um, but without further ado, let, let's get into this story. Um, okay, there we go. So uh, this story isn't really about me, uh, but I do think that it's good to kind of understand the storyteller, why they're they're telling the story. So let, let's cover some basics really quick. Um, I am a developer advocate and I'm very accustomed to answering the question of like, what exactly is that? Um, a, a developer advocate is someone who is a developer or identifies as a developer. Um, and the way that I describe my role at Parity is I work to make it easy for people to understand the capabilities that we produce and continually work to improve the experience of interacting with those capabilities. Uh, I, I have a computer science degree, but, but prior to that, I worked in the hospitality industry. Uh, I went to cooking school. So definitely come from like a very people focused customer service centric kind of approach. And that kind of gets me into why I'm here doing this as a developer advocate. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be working with technologies that allow people to communicate in new and better and different ways and, and really do what I hope is like making the world a better place. And of course, the way that we're doing that is by facilitating trustless decentralized consensus with blockchain. And in particular, we're doing that with substrate and frame. Uh, and so kind of what this is all to say is that I've spent basically the past six months or so kind of learning about substrate from this point of view as a developer advocate. And I think and I hope that what this has provided me with is kind of a unique perspective to kind of glue together some of the really amazing visionary talks that you just heard, kind of higher level stuff, and kind of help provide a soft landing into some of these more technical talks that are going to come. So that's enough about me. Let's get into the real story here. Let's talk about Substrate. So this is one way that I have conceptualized substrate and what it is and what it does. And in particular, what you see here is a diagram of a substrate client or a substrate node. And so if you're working with the substrate project, building a substrate chain, this is the output, the application binary that you create when you build that project. And so this is a, a program that you run on your machine, on your computer, that allows you to participate in this blockchain network. And why do people participate in a blockchain network? Again, they do it because they want to facilitate trustless consensus around the state of some system as it evolves over time. And the way that we represent that system, the engine of that system, <clears throat> to harken back to Fred's talk, is, is the runtime. And this, is, this image is an abstraction. So there, there are things that are purposefully elided over. And, and I think one interesting way to describe this diagram is to talk about where I've broken some abstractions. And so you see here that I've, I've represented the native runtime and the WASM runtime, which I think is something that you should be pretty familiar with now. This is the mechanism that facilitates forkless runtime upgrades that, that you heard Fred and Gav talk about. Uh, but really what you should imagine is that there's kind of like this executor right here that's deciding whether or not a given call is dispatched to the native runtime or the WASM runtime. But nonetheless, we have this runtime, which allows us to 
to maintain changes to state as it evolves over time. That state is persisted in a key value database. You heard Gav talk about that a little bit. We're using RocksDB, but developing this new, better parity DB. And we not only maintain snapshots of state, but we maintain historical state. And that's stored in the same database as a series of blocks. And so then we have some kind of gadgetry and machinations around this engine that allows us to develop this decentralized consensus and make changes to the state as it evolves over time. So let's start to look at how some of these components interact with one another and kind of bust out of the runtime a little bit. Um, the RPC server is really kind of the entry point for users coming into the blockchain. And so, oops, hit the wrong button there. Uh, that facilitates a couple of different kinds of interactions as you come into that RPC server with requests. You can make queries about the state of the storage at a given point in time, or, uh, well, sorry, the, the current state of storage or, or maybe historical storage by querying the blocks. And then you can also, of course, submit transactions to update that state. And so, those transactions flow through the RPC server into the transaction pool, and the transaction pool then distributes them to the runtime and, of course, gossips them across the blockchain network over this libp2p networking layer. And then those blockchain nodes all come together and using each their own networking capabilities, they gossip these transactions there's a separate module. I hope you're kind of seeing the way that the, the modular nature of, of substrate that Fred talked about and, and Gav talked about is really expressed in this diagram. So it comes through the networking module into the consensus module. Eventually what that allows us to do is come to some consensus on the canonical state of that chain over time. And then of course, as you can see, this is getting a little bit on the complicated side. And so we're gonna have some telemetry there that allows you to, to monitor all of that. And that's an embedded Prometheus server. Um, so this is kind of big picture what we're talking about here. So let's talk a little bit more about the runtime in particular and what that is. And actually, this is a really good time for me to, to shout out to all of my colleagues who helped me prepare this presentation, this diagram in particular, and then also some of these other awesome images that you see over here on the side. Uh, these were created by, by my colleagues, Sophia and Sveta. So thank you very much, guys. Uh, and so what, what these images represent is the, the, the runtime is a, a mechanism for dis defining changes to a system as it changes over time, which we've, we've kind of covered. And then it allows you to define some APIs around that. So the, the state transitions are then persisted to storage, the blocks that we talked about the, in, in the key value database. And, and because the definition of the runtime is itself an element in storage, we are able to perform these forkless runtime upgrades, which really is what takes Substrate to kind of like the next level. Um, and, and the way that we're doing this with Substrate here at Parity, certainly, is with the frame framework for developing blockchains. Gav and Fred talked a lot about this at a high level. And so what we can do now is kind of dive in a little bit more to the technical details and see how a frame runtime materializes. Um, so yeah, I think that pretty much covers what I wanted to talk about with respect to the runtime. Um, this is a, a, an approximation of, of what a frame runtime looks like. Uh, first and foremost, frame is a, I, I would describe it as like taking a compositional approach to, to runtime aggregation. That's what the name stands for, the framework for runtime aggregation of modularized entities. And so you can see that we have all these modularized entities here that represent domain specific mm, 
utilities or capabilities. And Frame allows you to take those different modules, pick and choose the ones that you want, and, and even build custom ones of your own, which we're going to talk about in a second, and then compile those into uh, a custom runtime that exposes unique features. Um, so what you see here is, you know, what I try to make sort of a, a standard or straightforward configuration. We have some consensus mechanisms here. We have some governance mechanisms, which is one of the really interesting things that Substrate brings to the table, especially when we're talking about novel mechanisms for human interaction uh, and some kind of utility mechanisms here. One of the things that wasn't included in this runtime in particular, but you see out here is this contracts palette. It's really cool. It basically provides another layer for people to deploy logic on to your blockchain. And you're going to be hearing more about that later today. It's some really cool developments there. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, so imagine that when you're using frame to build a runtime, what you're doing is you're composing modules. We call them pallets. And, and that's how you create a runtime. That should be a very familiar model for many software developers out there. So if you're building a frame palette, this is kind of what it looks like. I know Gav talked about the configuration interface or the configuration trait. So this is kind of the, the layer or the mechanism that allows you to inject dependencies from the outer runtime into your palette. So for instance, let's say with the contracts palette, we know that we need to have a way to pay our transaction fees and whatnot. And so we need to configure it with some type of balance that we probably want to share, some type of currency that we probably want to share amongst the runtime. You know, maybe it's the native currency of our chain, for instance. And so this configuration interface is the mechanism by which you sort of make the palette aware of the runtime's idea of the, the dependencies that you require. Like, for instance, events. That's a very common thing to see pop up in the configuration interface. So aside from the configuration interface, your palette can define some kind of core objects, namely storage items, which is the, the basic capabilities, the, the state that you're manipulating. And then you can define events and errors on top of those state transitions that for events define when a state transition was successful or an error can let people know if a state transition was of course unsuccessful. And so then finally, you wanna give people a way to interact with these storage capabilities. And so dispatchables are the elements of a palette that allow transactions to happen from outside of the blockchain, or pallets can also expose a public API that can be used like intra pallet within a runtime. And so that's another element of a pallet. So when you're building pallets, this is kind of what you're building. Now, this is all very frame focused, and that's where I spend a lot of my time. Uh, but there's other ways to build runtimes for Substrate. As long as it compiles down to WASM, that's kind of the, the main requirement. And so later today, you're going to hear uh, from Daniel from LineChain, and he's going to talk about using assembly script, which is TypeScript that compiles to WASM to build Substrate runtime. So a totally different way of doing things. Uh, but I know most about Frame, so that's what I talk about. Uh, let, okay, let's talk a little bit about the, the RPC server, what that is, a little bit about the transaction pool. As you saw, one of the components of the chain is this RPC server. It exposes HTTP and WebSocket interfaces for different types of, you know, request response or pub sub type protocols. Frame is automatically going to wire up the this RPC for you for all of these transactions and storage queries and stuff that we talked about. Uh, but if you want to dig a little bit deeper into it, there is configurable RPCs, which I think is something Gav talked about a little bit. And you're going to hear Tomas talk about it uh, in, in just a 
few minutes, you know, an hour or so. Uh, so definitely lots of opportunities to kind of dig in and hack around at the RPC layer. And even at the transaction pool layer, there's a rich set of interfaces that are decoupled from the, the runtime, but that allow you to interact with it. And so you can order these transactions with respect to their priority, their dependencies on one another, how long they should live. So modular, flexible, customizable capabilities at the RPC and transaction pool layer. The networking and consensus layers are kind of where we take all of this to that next gen interoperable level that, that is what makes Polkadot so exciting. So the basis of the consensus capabilities is of course the, the networking capabilities that substrate chains use. And that is this lib P2P networking stack. And if you go and you look at the Rust lib P2P GitHub repo, you'll see that many of the lead contributors are parity team members. And so there's a real kind of lineage there from, from lib P2P into substrate and, and even the polka dot network. And so it's, it's cool to kind of think about these things and understand them. And so what lib P2P is, is it's this multi protocol networking stack for decentralized peer to peer networking. And that provides a flexible foundation for implementing all different types of consensus mechanisms, protocols, gadgets, which of course is not always the most straightforward thing to do. With flexibility comes complexity. And so many of the, the crates and the pallets that ship with substrate relate to powerful consensus engines that were designed by Web3 Foundation researchers based on academic papers that are published out there that you can read. And this is all kind of baked in to the core of Substrate, but baked in in a way that is somewhat, that is very customizable and flexible um, and, and relatively easy to work with. Um, and then as I kind of teased at the beginning, this is all coming to, together to define this heterogeneous, multi-consensus, chain of chain architecture. And so this is really kind of what I hope is kind of leading you into the next talk, which is gonna be Basti talking all about parachains and uh, the uh, really amazing interoperability capabilities that they provide and how you can interact with them today, certainly on your own computer, and really soon on improved versions of the Rococo test network. So I hope that that kind of gives you, uh, as I said, kind of a soft landing into some of the more deeper technical topics that you're gonna hear about today. I hope you can tell that I love talking about this stuff. Uh, so please contact me, I shared these slides, so you should be able to, to have clickable links here. And uh, yeah, please come to the Substrate Developer Hub, start hacking on this yourself, join our technical chat, and I'll help you to do so. So I think that that takes me to my time, and that's pretty much what I got to say. That's great. Thank you so much, Dan. It looks like we don't have any questions in the channel, but again, everyone can go and join the Discord channel. Kristen just shared it in the chat. If you want to further connect on the anatomy of the Substrate node structure, Cool. <laughs> Bye, guys. All right. See you in the next session.